This week in Chapter 16 in Environmental Science, we'll be talking about renewable energy alternatives. In this chapter, we'll understand the following. Reasons for seeking alternative fuels, major sources of renewable energy, solar energy, wind energy, geothermal energy, ocean energy, hydroelectric power, bioenergy, and hydrogen fuel cells. Speaking of renewable energy alternatives, our central case study for the chapter is Germany Goes Solar. Did you know that? Germany is the world's leader in production of photovoltaic solar power or PV solar power. It might sound interesting and you might not expect it because Germany is kind of a cool and cloudy country. Most people don't associate it with sunshine, let alone solar power. So you might wonder, how is this happening? Well, a bold federal policy is using economic incentives to promote solar power and other forms of renewable energy. After crises like the Chernobyl nuclear power plant and uh, the Fukushima power plant meltdown, federal policies in federal officers are really pushing alternative energy. One thing that's helping this happen is called the feed-in tariff system, whereby utilities are required to buy power from anyone who can generate power from renewable energy sources and then feed it into the electric grid. Under this system, utilities must pay guaranteed premium prices for this power under long-term contracts. As a result, German homeowners and businesses have rushed to install PV panels and are selling their excess solar power to utilities at profits. And these tariffs actually apply to all forms of renewable energy. German industries are starting to be known as a world leader in green tech and are serving as a model for others in cutting their use of energy by fossil fuels they've actually done some very good things they've reduced their emissions from carbon dioxide by hundred and forty million tons a year and that's equal to taking 24 million cars off the road and since 1990 their carbon dioxide emissions from German energy sources have fallen by 24 percent and other pollutants have declined as well such as methane and nitrogen oxides and carbon monoxides and VOCs and dust. They can truly be thought of as a model for how other countries should begin to change over to renewable energy resources we have alternatives to fossil fuels. Our global economy is powered by fossil fuels as we know from last chapter. Oil, coal, and natural, natural gas supply four-fifths of our energy. They power two-thirds of the world's electricity. And renewable sources are used relatively less for transportation and relatively more for generating electricity. We can see some visuals of this in our charts to the right. Nations are looking for ways to move away from fossil fuels while ensuring a reliable energy supply. Nuclear energy is the main non-renewable alternative. And renewables also include hydroelectric power and biomass. And they're well established and wild, widely used. New renewables are not widely used and are still being developed to use in, gener in generating electricity, heating of air and water, and providing fuel for vehicles. Remember that perpetually renewable sources include energy from the sun, wind, earth's geothermal heat, and ocean water. Renewable energy offers advantages Renewable energy sources reduce air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. And remember, those things 
have been driving our global climate change, but renewable energy sources can reduce this. They've also created what are called green collar jobs because to have renewable energy sources, we need people to create them, design them, install them, and to maintain them. Policy by our governments and investment can accelerate this transition. Although prices are falling, most renewable energy remains more expensive than fossil fuels at this point. Conventional sources get more government subsidies and tax breaks. And policies keep fossil fuels cheap, which then hurts renewables. For America to remain a global leader, political and financial support will need to be redirected toward renewable energy. In our science behind the story in the chapter, we see the story of Mark Jacobson of Stanford University who's dived deep into the research of renewable energy resources and has looked at the impacts of various energy sources across their entire life cycle. In all of his findings and research, he's found that wind power would be the most desirable, followed by concentrated solar power and geothermal power, tidal power, and PV solar. The worst, with the greatest and worst impacts of renewables, were corn ethanol and cellulosic ethanol. Solar energy is renewable, perpetually actually. Each square meter of Earth receives 17 times the energy of a light bulb. In passive solar energy collection, buildings are designed to maximize absorption of sunlight in the winter. But in active solar collection, they use technology to focus, move, or store solar energy. One such method is flat plate solar collectors. They're dark colored and heat absorbing metal plates that are mounted on rooftops. Water, air, or antifreeze runs through the collectors, transferring heat throughout the building. And heated water is then stored and used later. Over 200 million U.S. homes and businesses heat water with solar collectors, and most is for swimming pools. Here's a diagram showing this. Concentrated solar power, also known as CSP, technologies that concentrate solar energy to generate electricity. Mirrors are used to track the sun's movement. And solar cookers, simple portable ovens that use reflectors to focus sunlight onto food are another way to use the sun's energy. Photovoltaic or PV cells can also be used to generate electricity. Watches and calculators are already made that contain small PV cells. But on roofs, PV cells are arranged in modules, which comprise panels that are gathered into arrays, shown in the diagram below. Thin film solar cells are PV materials that are compressed into thin sheets. They're less efficient but cheaper and they can be incorporated into roofing shingles as well and also into roads. Producers of PV electricity can then sell their power to a utility. Net metering is another method where the value of the power that the consumer provides is subtracted from their monthly utility bill. And feed-in tariffs, like the ones used in Germany, can pay producers more than the market price of power, so that power producers turn a profit. Solar energy offers many benefits. It uses no fuels, they're quiet, they're safe, and contain no moving parts and require little maintenance. 
They allow local decentralized control over power and are especially helpful in developing nations. In developed nations, PV owners can sell excess electricity to their local utility and they help to create jobs, ones that are called green collar jobs. PV cells don't emit greenhouse gases or air pollution when they're up and running. But the location and timing and the cost can be drawbacks. Not all regions are sunny enough for solar energy and daily and seasonal variation can pose problems. So we would need to come up with a way to store it, for example, possibly in batteries, or to have a backup plan, like backup power. Solar produces the most expensive electricity as well, but prices have dropped and efficiency has increased. And it's expanding. Solar energy was pushed to the sidelines as fossil fuels dominated our economy. Because of lack of investment, solar energy contributes only a minuscule part of energy production. But solar energy use has increased 30% per year since 1971, and it's attractive, especially in developing nations, where hundreds of millions of people don't even have electricity. Solar energy can be a viable alternative for them. China leads the world in PV cell production, and the U.S. may recover its leadership as a result of tax credits and state initiatives. Solar energy use would increase, or should increase, as a result of falling prices and improved technologies and economic incentives, like the ones in Germany. Wind turbines convert kinetic energy that's energy of motion, to electrical energy. In wind, in wind energy, energy is derived from movement of air, an indirect form of solar energy, as we know that our sun drives our climate and our winds on Earth. Wind turbines are devices that convert the wind's kinetic energy into electric energy. Wind blowing into a turbine turns the blades. The nacelle contains the generator. In the picture here, we can see what the nacelle is right here. These are towers that are 260 feet tall, and wind farms can contain hundreds of turbines. Wind power is growing fast. Five nations produce 75% of the world's wind power, but dozens of nations now produce wind power as well. The U.S. growth in wind power has been haphazard, and a long-term federal tax credit would encourage growth. Offshore sites, though, hold promise. Wind speeds are 20% greater over water than over land and have less air turbulence over water. Costs to erect and maintain turbines in water are higher, though, but more power would be produced and, in the end, it would be more profitable there. Currently, turbines are limited to shallow water. And the first U.S. offshore wind farm will have 130 turbines off Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Wind, like solar energy, produces no emissions once installed and helps to prevent the release of carbon dioxide and sulfurs and nitrous oxides and mercuries into the environment. It's more efficient than conventional power sources. Turbines produce 20 times more energy than they consume. Turbines use less water than conventional power plants. Local areas can become more self-sufficient. Farmers and ranchers can lease their land, which can then allow them to receive extra revenue while still using the land. Advancing technology is also reducing the cost of wind farm construction. 85,000 employees now work in the wind industry. Over 100 colleges and universities offer programs and degrees that train people for jobs in renewable energy. Wind power has limitations, though, because the wind does vary from time to time and place to place. And it can be one of several sources of electricity. Batteries or hydrogen fuel can store the energy. 
Wind sources are not always near population centers that need the energy. So transmission networks would need to be expanded. Local residents often oppose the wind farms, often because the turbines can kill birds and bats when they fly into the rotating blades. Here's some diagrams of the U.S. wind generating capacity. Mountainous regions have the most wind and turbines. Geothermal energy. We can harness geothermal energy for heating and electricity. It comes from beneath the Earth's surface. From the radioactive decay of elements under high pressures deep inside the planet, we have heat generated. And this rises up through the magma and fissures and cracks. And then it heats groundwater and erupts as geysers or submarine hydrothermal vents. And this hot water can be used directly to heat a building. Geothermal power plants can use hot water or steam to generate electricity. Geothermal power plants harness naturally heated water and steam to generate electricity, as shown in this diagram below. We can take advantage of natural temperature differences between soil and air. Soil temperatures can vary less than air temperatures. And we can use heat pumps to make use of temperature differences. Ground source heat pumps, or GSHPs, are geothermal pumps that heat buildings in the winter by transferring heat from the ground to the building. In summer, heat is transferred from the building to the ground. And more than 600,000 U.S. homes use GSHPs. They heat and cool spaces more efficiently and reduce electricity and emissions. Geothermal power does have its pros and cons like other renewable sources. Geothermal power does reduce emissions, much like wind and solar energy. It's not sustainable, though, if the water is withdrawn faster than it can be recharged. Patterns of geothermal activity in the crust can shift. And dissolved salts and minerals can corrode equipment and pollute the air. And it's limited to areas where the energy can actually be tapped. Engineers are working to overcome these limitations. Enhanced geothermal systems, or EGSs, are uh, water that's put into deep holes and then when heated it's withdrawn to generate electricity and could be used in many locations but these can trigger minor earthquakes so our use of geothermal power may stay localized we can also harness energy from tides waves and currents kinetic energy from the natural motion of ocean water can generate electrical power, like uh, tidal energy. So we can build dams across the outlets of tidal basins when water is trapped behind the gate. And the tide currents can then turn the turbines to generate electricity. Tidal stations have the pro that they don't release emissions, but they can change the area's ecology because we're damming up water. Wave energy is the motion of waves that's harnessed and converted from mechanical energy to electricity. Many designs exist, but still need to be tested. Ocean currents like the Gulf Stream can be used, and underwater turbines have been erected off of Europe. Each day, tropical oceans absorb solar radiation equal to the heat content of 250 billion barrels of oil. That's each day. Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, or OTEC, uses temperature differences between the surface and deep water. Warm surface water evaporates chemicals which spin turbines to generate electricity. Or warm surface water is evaporated in a vacuum and its steam turns turbines. 
The costs of this are high and no facility operates commercially yet. There's also hydroelectric power, also called hydropower. It uses the kinetic energy of moving water to turn turbines to generate electricity and uses three approaches. First, there's the storage technique in which water is stored in reservoirs behind dams and then passes through the dam and turns a turbine. There's the run of the river approach. It generates electricity without disrupting the river's flow where water flows through a pipe then returns to the river. It's useful in remote regions away from electric grids. Then there's the pumped storage where water is pumped to a high reservoir that flows downward through a turbine. Hydropower has two clear advantages over fossil fuels for producing electricity. It's renewable. As long as precipitation fills rivers, we can use water to turn turbines. And it's clean. There's no carbon dioxide emitted from this. And hydropower is efficient. It has an ER01 of 10 to 1. And it's as high as any modern day energy source. But there's some impacts like damming rivers, destroys wildlife habitat. Natural flooding cycles of rivers can also be disrupted, causing floodplains downstream not downstream not to get their nutrients. And water temperatures could be changed, which could be dangerous to fish and other species. And dams can block the natural passage and migration of certain fish. It also could reduce biodiversity. But dams have helped many nations develop, like Canada, Brazil, Switzerland. China's Three Gorges Dam is the world's largest dam. But hydropower isn't likely to expand much more. Most of the world's large rivers have already been dammed. People have grown aware of the ecological impacts of dams and resist more construction. 98% of U.S. suitable rivers have already been dammed as well, and the rest are protected. Bioenergy is another renewable resource, also called biomass energy. It's obtained from the biomass of living organisms. Biomass is organic material from living or recently living organisms and include things like wood, charcoal, agricultural crops, and manure. The sustainable use of bioenergy requires careful consideration of the biomass source. Over one billion people use fire for heat, cooking, and light. We hi hi harness bioenergy by burning biomass for heating and use biomass to generate electricity and process biomass to create liquid fuels for transportation. Here's some of the sources of uh, biomass, like wood from trees, charcoal, manure, crop residues like corn stalks, wood waste from logging, processing waste like pulp, things from paper mills, livestock waste from feedlots, corn grown for ethanol, soybeans, rapeseed, and other crops grown for biodiesel, algae, which is grown for biofuels, and other plant matter that's used to produce cellulosic ethanol. We use biomass to generate electricity. Biopower, biomass sources are burned in power plants, and this generates heat and electricity. And waste products of industries or processes like woody debris, pulp, and crop residues can be used. And bioenergy crops can be used. Those are like fast-growing willow trees and bamboo and switchgrass. There's also combustion strategies such as co-firing, which combines biomass and coal in specialized boilers. There's gasification, which turns biomass to steam, and pyrolysis, which produces a liquid fuel. 
Biopower increases the efficiency in the waste recycling. It reduces carbon dioxide emissions. And capturing landfill gas reduces methane emissions. And it reduces sulfur dioxide emissions when used to replace coal. But burning crops deprives the soil of the nutrients that the crops would have provided had they been left there. And the soil can then become progressively depleted of nutrients. Biofuels can also power vehicles like liquid fuels used to power automobiles, like ethanol. It's a biofuel made by fermenting carbohydrate-rich crops and then added to U.S. gasoline. In 2013, 13.3 billion gallon, gallons were made in the U.S. and was mostly made from corn. And congressional mandates will increase ethanol production. Flexible fuel vehicles run on what's called E85, and that's 85% ethanol, 15% gasoline, gasoline. Over 15 million cars in the U.S. can do this. Most gas stations don't offer this fuel, but some do. Almost all new Brazilian cars are flexible fuel vehicles. In the gas, Crushed sugar cane residue is used to make ethanol, and it's in half of all the fuel that Brazil drivers use. Using ethanol for fuel may not be as sustainable as we thought, though. Environmental scientists don't like corn-based ethanol. Growing corn impacts ecosystems because we have to use pesticides and fertilizers, and use up water in irrigation and it takes up precious land. Using the corn crop to produce ethanol drives up food prices as well. And growing corn requires energy for the equipment and for making the pesticides and applying them and fertilizers and for the transportation. It's ERO1 ratio, ER, I mean EROI ratio is about 1.5 to 1 so it's quite inefficient. To produce all automobile used in the U.S. with ethanol from U.S. corn, the nation would need to expand its already immense corn acreage by more than four times. Biodiesel can power engines. Biodiesel is produced from vegetable oil, which is the cooking grease and animal fat and other soybeans. It can make vegetable oil, oil palms, and rapeseed and vehicles can run on 100% biodiesel. B20 is a fuel that's 20% biodiesel. Biodiesel can reduce emissions and has good fuel economy, but costs a bit more than gasoline. And crops are specially grown for this, which can lead to overuse of land and deforestation. Novel biofuels are being developed, like other crops are being grown to develop this, like wheat, sorghum, sugar beets, hemp, and grasses. Algae can produce lipids that can be converted to biodiesel. Their carbohydrates can be fermented to make ethanol and can be grown in ponds and tanks and photobioreactors. They grow fast and can be harvested every few days. Cellulosic ethanol, it's produced from structural plant material like corn stalks that would have no food value. Is bioenergy carbon neutral? In principle, biomass energy releases no net carbon. Photosynthesis removes carbon that's released when biomass is burned. Burning biomass is not carbon neutral. If forests are destroyed to plant the bioenergy crops, and if we use fossil fuel energy in things like running the tractors and making and applying the fertilizers, etc. The International Climate Change Policy does not encourage sustainable bioenergy approaches. Only emissions from energy use are counted toward controlling emissions, not land use changes.
Hydrogen and fuel cells are another alternative. Hydrogen fuel could store energy cleanly and efficiently by using the world's simplest and most abundant element, hydrogen, as a fuel. Hydrogen is an energy carrier, not an energy source. Electricity produced from intermittent sources, like sun and wind, would be used to produce hydrogen. And then the fuel cells, like hydrogen batteries, would use the hydrogen to produce electricity to power cars, homes, and computers. And governments are funding research into this technology. Here's a diagram of what a hydrogen fuel cell looks like. Hydrogen fuel may be produced from water or other matter. Hydrogen gas does not exist freely on Earth. Energy is used to force molecules to release the hydrogen. In electrolysis, electricity is used to split hydrogen from water in this reaction listed here. It may cause pollution, though, depending on the source of electricity. And hydrogen's production impact depends on the source of electricity used in the electrolysis and the hydrogen source. And if using methane, it produces the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. And that's shown in this reaction here. Once isolated, though, hydrogen gas can be used as a fuel to produce electricity within fuel cells. And the chemical reaction is the reverse of electrolysis, where we're left with water. There's cost. It needs massive and costly development of infrastructure to get it going. And leakage of hydrogen could deplete stratospheric ozone. That could be a big problem. But there's also benefits that will never run out of hydrogen. It can be clean and non-toxic, produce few greenhouse gases, few pollutants. And if kept under pressure, it's no more dangerous than gasoline in tanks. Hydrogen fuel cells are up to 90% energy efficient and they're silent and non-polluting and don't need recharging. In conclusion, we need to shift to renewable energy. Biomass energy sources include wood and newer biofuels. They can be carbon neutral but are not strictly renewable. Hydropower is renewable, pollution free, and it's, um, it's nearing maximal use though and can involve substantial ecological impacts. Renewable sources like solar, wind, geothermal, and ocean energy sources and hydrogen fuel are promising alternatives. And they need funding for research and development. 